It's uh, my pleasure to welcome everyone to the 13th annual uh, DNW Lytle Electrical and Computing Engineered Engineering Endowed Lecture Series. Uh, my name is Eric Clavens. I'm the chair of the Electrical Computer and Computer Engineering Department, um, and I'm also a faculty member. I've been with the department for 17 years, um, and this is one of uh, of our department's um, favorite events. And I, I really wish that we could have it in in person. Um, but we've all had to adapt. And it's interesting actually, because we might actually um, keep some aspects of this uh, virtual event when we, when we do go back in person, because it allows people from all over the world to attend um, like we have today. So um, I'm glad everybody was able to log in and, and be a part of this um, event. Uh, before we get uh, too far, I wanna make sure to um, uh, thank everyone for organizing uh, today's event. So um, the Lytle Committee, um, the events and PR team, our advancement team, um, as well as all of the panelists that we had this morning, and, and of course, um, our speaker, um, who we'll introduce in a minute. Um, a little bit of uh, uh, history here. So uh, the Lytle Lecture Series honors the memory of Professor Dean W. Lytle, um, who began his career uh, as an assistant professor in our department in 1958. Um, and he was a great teacher and a mentor and an intellectual powerhouse uh, in the department. Professor Lytle's research focus was in communications, networks, probability, and signal processing. Uh, he, authored, uh, co he authored two textbooks, uh, and his consulting work included appointments at Boeing and Honeywell uh, and, and at Bell Labs. Um, today, uh, we are pleased to welcome um, the members of the Lytle family who are also joining this event um, virtually. Uh, the Lytle Endowed Lecture Series is made, impossible, made possible um, with endowed funds provided by Dean Lytle's wife, Marilyn. Lytle and his PhD student, Louis Scharf, who's here in the um, one of the panelists, you can see, uh, and who led uh, fundraising events um, and invited many other donors uh, in the UW ECE community to honor Dean Lytle's uh, uh, legacy. So we thank them. Um, and I, I would like to extend a personal thanks um, to all of those who contributed to support um, our department and to make this lectureship, uh, lectureship a reality um, for our department. It really is um, one of the one of the nicest events that we have every year. Um, and so it's wonderful to, um, it's wonderful to keep that going. Um, I'd like to introduce now uh, Professor Mariam Fazel, who's the host of the Lytle Lecture Series. Mm -hmm. Professor Fazel received her PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford, uh, and she's an NSF Career Award re recipient, and she's the first recipient of the Morthy Family um, uh, Career Development Professorship. And, uh, which was established by uh, Ganes and Hima Morthy in 2019 to recruit, uh, reward, and retain UW ECE faculty members who have de demonstrated significant promise early in their careers. Uh, Mariam's research interests are in mathematical optimization, machine learning, um, and data science. Uh, and uh, in addition to leading a new NSF center um, uh, on the uh, foundations of data science, she also holds adjunct appointments in um, the UW Mathematics uh, and Statistics Departments, as well as in the Paul G. Allen School for Computer Science and Engineering. So please join me in welcoming Professor Fazel, uh, who'd like to um, give a few uh, remarks um, and welcome our um, speaker today, Professor Scott Aronson. Thank you, Eric. Um, so it's my great pleasure to welcome Scott Aronson to the ECE Virtual Light Lecture of 2020. Uh, Scott is the David J. Broughton Centennial Professor of Computer Science at the University of Texas at Austin, where he's also the director of the Quantum Information Center. He received his bachelor's degree from Cornell and his PhD from UC Berkeley in 2004. Uh, before joining UT Austin, he spent nine years as a professor in electrical engineering and computer science at MIT. Scott's research has focused mainly on the capabilities and limits of quantum computers and more generally on algorithms and computational complexity questions. Among the awards that he's been recognized with are the PKs Award or the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers awarded by US President annually, very big award, uh, as well as the National Science Foundation's Waterman Award, which is the highest honors given by the NSF and the Tomasini Kisesi Prize in Physics. Um, Scott has written um, a book titled Quantum Computing Since Democritus, which I highly recommend. This was published in 2013 uh, by Cambridge University Press. Um, it's a very interesting book. It's actually a nice, insightful and accessible overview that touches upon um, uh, 
a broad range of overview of quantum computing that touches upon a broad range of topics from the views of ancient philosophers in antiquity to logic to complexity theory to quantum computing and its present day implications. Um, I also wanted to mention if you haven't, uh, if you aren't already familiar with uh, the engaging blog that Scott runs actually very actively with in very interesting blog posts. Um, also to get a feel for Scott's interest in quantum computation and many other things uh, such as artificial intelligence, singularity, black holes, and philosophy of science more generally, I really recommend watching his uh, Scott's podcast uh, interviews with Lex Friedman, which you can find online. I found these super interesting. Before I turn this over to Scott, I wanted to ask the audience to please use the Q&A feature in Zoom to submit questions. You can submit your questions during the talk. Um, or you can upvote questions submitted by others. And we will be discussing your questions at the Q&A sessions that follows uh, the talk immediately. Um, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Scott Aronson. And Scott, the stage is yours. Uh, all right, can, uh, can you see that? Yes. Uh, all right, good. Um, here we go. Okay, well, well, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you to the Lytle family for uh, you know, uh, arranging the, uh, 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 sponsoring this, this series. Uh, I, um, I've, I've uh, been a, a friend of you know, UW for a long time. I've always loved uh, visiting and uh, I was looking forward to visiting uh, for this talk. Uh, um, you know, um, before uh, COVID shut down the world, but uh, you know, uh, what can we do? Uh, speaking of which, uh, what I want to talk about today is, uh, you know, a, a major development in quantum computing uh, that happened, um, you know, just, just a few months before COVID shut everything down. So uh, about a year ago um, by a, a, a team at, at, at Google uh, in, in Santa Barbara. Uh, I was not part of the team that uh, uh, produced this, this engineering accomplishment, this uh, demonstration of quantum computational supremacy. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a theorist, you know, meaning that my view of what a quantum computer is, you know, may, maybe it's a little bit like this cartoon here, uh, which, you know, when I did a Google image search for quantum computer, this is what comes up. Well, you know, that, that's, that's not exactly what they look like. You know, I've uh, done some, some lab tours. I can, I can report that to you. But, uh, um, uh, you know, um, along with others, um, I was involved in uh, uh, work in, in uh, quantum computing theory uh, over the last um, decade or so that um, created some of the theoretical foundation uh, for, for this experiment that Google decided to do. So I want to tell you about that, about you know why uh, why why some of us are excited about it, and more broadly about uh, 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 what is quantum computing, uh, what, what what do we hope for from it. So uh, you know, in order to uh, tell you what a, a quantum computer is, you know, the first step is I have to tell you what quantum mechanics is, uh, and. You know, quantum mechanics has a reputation for being, you know, incredibly uh, hard, and uh, um, um, you would have to, you know, study physics for for years and years to have any hope of understanding it. People say things like, you know, if you think you understand it, then you don't understand it, and so on. Uh, you know, so uh, I'm 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 not a physicist. I'm a computer scientist. Uh, and and uh, so I, I feel free to let you in on a secret, which is that quantum mechanics is actually much, much simpler than, than people make it out to be uh, once you take the physics out of it. Okay, so uh, the way that uh, we tend to think about quantum mechanics uh, in quantum computing and quantum information is um, as a certain generalization of the rules of probability themselves. So it's almost like it, it's, it's barely even physics. It's an operating system that the rest of physics runs on as, as application programs, uh, uh, if you'd like. Um, and, 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 and what does this operating system say? Well, it, it, it was formulated in the 1920s. Uh, it, uh, it, 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 it has not changed since that time. You know, we keep discovering more about it and more things that we can do with it. 
But uh, you know, uh, quantum mechanics, as I'll explain it to you, you know, has uh, has been the same since uh, Heisenberg and Schrodinger, you know, wrote it down in uh, 1925 and 26. Now. Uh, um, uh, um, famously, uh, quantum mechanics says that, uh, you know, there is a probabilistic aspect to the world, you know, at the lowest possible level, right? So if uh, you had a, a uranium atom, right, it could be in exactly the same initial condition. And yet, you know, physics cannot tell you whether it will, will have decayed within a certain amount of time or not, right? Uh, uh, just, you know, it can only tell you what is the probability that it will have decayed within that time. You know, and, and, and Einstein uh, famously had a great deal of trouble with that. You know, he didn't like that God was playing dice, so on. Uh, uh, but uh, the, the probability is not at all the strangest part about quantum mechanics. Okay, you know, if that was all there was to it, you know, uh, uh, big deal. Okay, uh, the, uh, uh, what, what, is, what is really unique about quantum mechanics is what we have to do in order to calculate the probability that something will happen, right? So, you know, normally a probability uh, is a real number between zero and one, right? And, uh, you know, like uh, I'm sure like many of you, I was compulsively checking uh, 538, you know, every, uh, every few minutes, uh, uh, you know, during uh, uh, the, 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 the election, right? And, you know, they might say there is a, uh, 9% or a 20% probability of something happening, they're never going to say there was a negative 20% chance, right? That would just be an error in their, in their model, right? Far less would they say that there is an I percent chance, you know, a, a, a chance involving a complex numbers or involving the square root of minus one, okay? The central thing that quantum mechanics says is that uh, uh, to each way that something could happen, we have to assign a number called an amplitude. Amplitudes are related to probabilities, uh, but they're not probabilities. Okay, and in particular, they can be positive or negative. In fact, they can even be complex numbers. Okay, and uh, if you want to know how likely something is to happen, you have to add up uh, the amplitudes for all of the possible ways that it could happen. Okay, and then. Uh, the rule is that you you take the the, uh, the 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 final total and and the square of its absolute value gives you the probability. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, uh, there's a very very famous experiment that uh, sort of uh, um, um, Richard Feynman used to say that if you understand this one experiment, all of quantum mechanics is contained in it. Okay, this is the the double slit experiment where we could shoot a photon. Uh, that, again, that's not exactly what a photon looks like, but it doesn't matter, uh, at, a, at a screen uh, with uh, two small slits in it. And we look at where it ends up on a second screen. And, you know, we find that where it lands is a uh, probabilistic event, right? We can repeat over and over, and sometimes the photon will land uh, one place, sometimes another. Okay? As I said, that itself is not the strange part. The strange part is that there are certain places where the photon uh, sort of does not like to appear, or in like dark patches on the second screen, right, where there's a, a very small probability uh, of, of it landing there. Uh, and yet, if I close off one of these two slits, then suddenly the photon can land in those places. Okay, so to say that again, by decreasing the number of paths that the photon can take to reach a certain place, I can increase the chance that it gets to that place. Okay? And basically, in the years between 1900 and 1926 or so, physicists found example after example of you know, phenomena that were like this, that they uh, could not otherwise explain uh, until they finally figured out uh, the, the secret that you have to describe uh, nature using these amplitudes. Okay? And the quantum mechanical explanation for what's going on is simply that, uh, you know, uh, uh, to, 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 to know how likely a photon is to land at a certain place, I have to add up two contributions. It has an amplitude for getting there by going through the top slit, and it has an amplitude for getting there by going through the bottom slit. Okay, but now 
if one of those amplitudes is positive and the other one is negative, then those two contributions can, as we say, interfere destructively and cancel each other out so that the total amplitude is zero and you never see the photon there. Okay, whereas if I close one of the slits, then I would only get the positive contribution or only the negative contribution. Okay, so now the amplitude is not zero and now I can see it there. Okay, this is the trick. It's this, this interference of amplitude. This is the thing that conventional probabilities don't do, but happens in quantum mechanics. So, you know, the, 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 what, the well, fundamentally what quantum mechanics says about the world is that if you have any physical system, uh, you know, and, and typically we, we notice this most easily uh, if, if the system is an electron, an atomic nucleus, a photon, something like that. Although in principle, this would even be true for, for anything, for a, a cat, you know, for the room that you're in, for the whole universe. Okay, if you have any system uh, that can be in two perfectly distinguishable states, and let me just give them labels. I'll call them being a computer scientist. I'll call them zero and one. Uh, and, but, you know, uh, as a uh, uh, concession to the physicists, I'll use the notation that they use, which is called ket notation, uh, which is, you know, these sort of asymmetric uh, angle brackets. Okay, so the, the, this is just a, a notation that means quantum states. Um, then our system can also be in a superposition of the two states, uh, which uh, simply means a, a linear combination, it means uh, I have some amplitude for being zero, let's say call it alpha, and I have some other amplitude for being one, call it beta. So my state is alpha zero plus beta one, okay? And, um, you know, the amplitudes are normalized, so like they, they always have to give rise to probabilities that will add up to one. Um, and uh, if you've heard of a, a qubit, a qubit is the basic building block of quantum computing. It is simply, you know, a bit that can be in a superposition of the zero state and the one state. Okay, so it's a quant the quantum version of a bit. Now, if you look at a qubit, you never actually see it in a superposition of zero and one. Okay, if you ask a qubit, whether it's zero or it's one, then you force it to make up its mind about which one to be, okay? And it will always pick the answer zero with probability at the absolute value of alpha squared and one with probability absolute value of beta squared, okay? And whichever choice it makes, it then snaps to that choice, okay? So, it, you know, it, 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 you, you force it to make a choice, it's then sticking with it. Okay, if, uh, if it says that it's zero, then, you know, you can look again and it will still say that it's zero. Okay, or like if it was uh, an electron, for example, and you measured its spin, you know, which is just some property that an electron has, you know, and it said that my spin is up, then from now on, its spin really is up. Okay, uh, even if before you looked, it was uh, in a superposition of spin up and spin down. Okay, uh, so, you know, you might say, well, then if we, if we never see things in superpositions, then how do we know that they ever were in superpositions, right? How do we know that this is not just some fancy way of saying, well, we don't know uh, whether the, the, the qubit was zero or one, and then we looked and we saw what it was. Well, the, the reason we know is that when qubits are isolated from their environment, from the whole rest of the universe, then they, the amplitudes change over time by rules that are very different from the rules of conventional probability. In particular, we can see the different amplitudes interfere with each other, just like I was talking about before. Okay. Um, now, uh, you know, that's, that's one qubit, which is kind of, which is interesting enough, okay? But famously, if I have more than one qubit, uh, the rules of quantum mechanics are unequivocal that it is not enough to write down amplitudes separately for each qubit, okay? Uh, I might instead need to say there is some amplitude that both of these qubits are zero, and there is some amplitude that both of these qubits are one, okay? And, and what that would mean is that they are correlated, okay? And, and in a way where if I look at one of the qubits and I see that it's zero, then immediately I know that the other one is also zero. 
and, 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 and likewise for one. Okay, the quantum uh, version of correlation uh, is called entanglement. Okay, so, um, you know, I, so every possible configuration of all of the qubits together can get its own amplitude. Okay, and, you know, th that was, I mean, I mean, Sch Schrodinger says that, you know, all the way back in 1926. Okay, although, you know, I think the, the full staggeringness of what he was saying took decades to sink in on people. Okay, because what does it mean? It means if we had a thousand qubits, which could mean you know the state of a thousand particles, right? That's not a whole lot of particles, right? You know, you could have far more than that on, on the head of a pin. Uh, well, to just to just to represent you know the possible states that those particles could be in if they're interacting with each other, we need two to the one thousand amplitude, two to the thousand complex numbers. Okay, uh, one for every possible thousand bit string. Okay, two to the thousand power is a lot more than the number of subatomic particles in the whole observable universe. Okay, but you know, again, quantum mechanics is saying that all of these uh, amplitudes are some are in some sense there. Okay, they are affecting the probabilities of the things that we do see when when we look. Okay, so. You know, the chemists and physicists have known this for a long time, but they've known it mostly as a practical problem. That, you know, if you are trying to simulate um, atomic nuclei or molecules with your conventional computer in order to, to learn about their behavior, the difficulty of the simulation tends to increase exponentially with the number of particles, just because that is how many amplitudes you have to keep track of. Okay, so that's been a huge practical problem for you know simulating quantum physics. It's the reason why a lot of the largest supercomputers uh, in the world today are at least partly used for simulating quantum mechanics. Okay, but even they are are limited in you know the, the size of the systems that they can handle. Okay, but um, uh, about forty years ago. Uh, a few physicists, uh, most famously uh, Richard Feynman and David Deutsch, uh, had the remarkable idea that you know, if nature is giving us this computational lemon, why don't we make lemonade out of it? Uh, or in other words, why don't we build computers that themselves would be built out of these qubits, or what we now call qubits, uh, that could uh, um, have uh, uh, superpositions of, of, of different uh, states in their memory and that could exploit this entanglement and interference of amplitude. Now, of course, they then faced the question, supposing we built such a device, what they called a quantum computer, uh, what, what, what would it be good for? And at the time, they really only had one answer to that question, which is, well, it would be good for simulating quantum mechanics itself. Uh, and you know, as obvious as that sounds, I think that if and when quantum computing really becomes practical, that remains the most important uh, real application that we know about today, right? It, uh, if you're trying to design new drugs, you know, the, uh, or uh, new proteins, if you are um, trying to design new materials like uh, um, photovoltaics or high temperature superconductors, right, you have on your hands a many body quantum mechanics problem. Okay, and to whatever extent, you know, the, the quantum effects are important in um, making your system hard to simulate, uh, to that extent, a quantum computer could help you. Okay, um, but uh, it, was, it, was, it was only uh, uh, a decade after that, in the 90s, that people realized that quantum computers could also be used to solve a few purely classical problems, problems having nothing to do with quantum mechanics, much faster than we knew how to solve them with a classical computer. And that's what really started quantum computing as a field. That's what really started all of the, uh, the modern excitement about it. Uh, and, and you know, the question of, can we actually build this? Uh, so you know, at this point, I feel compelled to address maybe the central misconception uh, about quantum computing that you'll, you will have encountered you know, if you've read almost any popular article about the subject. People want to say, well, a quantum computer is just like a conventional computer, except it gets to try every possible answer in parallel. 
Okay, they are, you know, sometimes we'll say each possible answer in another parallel universe. Uh, and, um, you know, that, 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 that sounds really amazing if it's true, right? That sounds like, wow, that, you know, you could, uh, uh, there, 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 there's barely any limit to what you could do that way, right? You could just, uh, you know, try uh, um, two to the thousand power possible answers and then, you know, whichever parallel universe happened to find the right one, maybe it could just shout above all the others and say, everyone, I found it, look here. Um, unfortunately, it's not that simple. Okay, uh, so what is true is that with a quantum computer, you can create a superposition over all of the possible answers to your problem, even if there's an astronomical number of them, like you know, two to the thousand or two to the million. Okay, that's even an easy thing to do with a quantum computer. Now, the difficulty is that if you want a computer to be useful, at some point you have to look at it. Okay, you have to measure its state and get an output. And if you just took an equal superposition over all the possible answers to your hard problem, not having done anything else, then the rules of quantum mechanics are adamant. You know, that all you will see will be a completely random answer. Right? And well, if you just wanted a completely random answer, you could have picked one yourself, you know, just flip a coin a bunch of times or something, you know, probably saves billions of dollars in, you know, building the quantum computer. Okay, so, um, uh, you know, when we, when, as I said before, when we look, you know, this whole exponential quantum state almost entirely vanishes and we're left with just the tiniest trace of it, just a single random outcome, you know, whose probability is the absolute square of its amplitude. Okay. Uh, but again, amplitudes work differently from probabilities. Okay, so the entire hope uh, of getting an advantage from a quantum computer rests on exploiting the way that amplitudes work differently. Okay, and um, uh, uh, with every quantum algorithm, with every you know, algorithm for a quantum computer, uh, the, the game is that we want to choreograph a pattern of interference in such a way that for each wrong answer, each answer that we don't want to see, uh, some of the contributions to its amplitude are positive, let's say, and others are negative. So that the contributions all cancel each other out and the amplitudes for the wrong answers are zero or close to zero. Whereas for the right answer or the right answers, we want constructive interference meaning we would like all of the contributions to their amplitude to be pointing the same direction, or, you know, more or less the same direction. Okay, if we can arrange that, then when we look, we will see the right answer with a high probability. Of course, if we don't see the right answer, we can always just repeat our quantum computation a few times, you know, until we do see it. Okay, but, you know, our goal is to uh, get as much amplitude as we can onto the right answer uh, uh, by using interference, okay, uh, among all, you know, this exponential number of amplitudes. Uh, now, in order to be useful, we've got to do it quickly, faster than a classical computer could do the same thing, you know, otherwise, what's the point? And we have to choreograph this whole pattern of interference, you know, concentrating amplitude on the right answer even though we ourselves don't know in advance which answer is the right one. Because again, if, if we did, what would be the point? Okay, so this is a tall order, right? It is uh, uh, this really, really weird hammer that you know, nature is giving us for computation. And you know, it, took, it took more than a decade, as I said, for people to figure out you know, if there were sort of any interesting nails that this hammer could hit. You know, uh, besides just stimulating quantum phenomena themselves. Okay, so that's, uh, that's my like two slide summary of the theory of quantum computing. Uh, now, um, uh, you know, of course, a lot of the excitement uh, over the last 20 or 25 years has come from the prospect of actually building this, right? Actually building a machine uh, that would, that would uh, implement uh, the, these abstract ideas. So what would that machine look like? Well, the short answer is we don't know yet. Okay, there are a bunch of 
uh, uh, architectures that are being pursued in parallel. Uh, and um, I would say, you know, if there is a quantum analog of the transistor, it is like, you know, the building block of, you know, classical computing that is just so good that it, you know, destroyed all of its competitors. Uh, uh, that has not been invented yet. Okay, you know, optimistically, we are finally now entering the very, very early vacuum tube era of, of quantum computing, you know, having like finally graduated from the Charles Babbage era. Okay, but, um, you know, just like uh, in the old days, there were vacuum tubes, there were electromechanical relays, there were all kinds of ways that people envisioned for building classical computers. We have a bunch of ideas for how you would physically realize qubits. Uh, one idea is that you can take ions. Uh, um, so for example, uh, ytterbium nuclei, and uh, you can suspend them in a trap them in a magnetic field, uh, like uh, typically in a, in, a, in a line. You can uh, manipulate them using lasers. Uh, you can um, measure them to see uh, uh, you know, their, their, their spin direction, which you use as, as your qubit. Um, that, so this is called the trapped ion approach. It's being pursued by uh, Honeywell, uh, by a startup company called IonQ, and uh, by a bunch of others. Uh, they can now do you know, programmable uh, uh, devices with 30 or so ions you know, as, of, as of this year. Uh, you can also use um, neutral atoms, uh, as uh, with uh, Misha Lukin's group at Harvard. Uh, there are some serious players um, trying to do photonic quantum computing, where your qubit would be uh, the polarization or some other degree of freedom, like the spatial mode of, of, a, fo of, of a photon. Um, psi quantum uh, is this uh, very big startup in Palo Alto that's pursuing that. Uh, the group of Jianwei Pan in China uh, is also pursuing uh, photonic uh, quantum computing. Um, Microsoft research uh, has placed a huge bet on an idea that is, I would say, speculative even by the standards of quantum computing, uh, which is called topological quantum computing or computing with non-abelian anions. So this is an approach that, uh, if it works, seems like it is inherently much more robust than any other known way to build a quantum computer. Okay, so some people think that, that this could ultimately be the right way to scale. Uh, but so far, people have not people have not yet succeeded in making even one qubit uh, via this um, non-abelian anion approach. Okay, if you if you want to get it to work, all you have to do is create a new state of matter that's uh, never been seen in nature. That's what they're trying to do. Okay, now the approach. Uh, that is maybe the furthest along uh, at this moment, and the one that led to the Google result a year ago uh, that I'll talk about is called superconducting qubits. Um, and uh, this is where uh, we take a chip, looks like an ordinary computer chip, uh, but we have um, um, uh, on it, we have um, um, superconducting uh, 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 coils. So we have wires that can you know, store uh, a zero or a one, and they're in the state of their current. We then take this chip, we put it in a dilution refrigerator. That's this thing that looks like an upside down wedding cake down here. And we cool it to uh, about 10 millikelvin, uh, you know, a hundredth of a degree above absolute zero. That, that, that is when we get superconductivity, which in particular means that these uh, um, uh, um, currents can flow in a superposition of the zero state and the one state. So they now behave as qubits. Um, I should say th these things are enormous by the standards of qubits. Uh, you can all, um, you could almost see them with the naked eye. Okay, uh, but um, uh, we we have uh, a classical control system that is outside of the dilution refrigerator uh, with, that has wires going into the chip that is sending signals that tell each qubit exactly what it's supposed to do when. Okay, so the, the, the system is programmable. You know, that, that, that's the sense in which it's a, a computer at all. Okay, and uh, as, as we'll see, Google's um, you know, most recent uh, chips have uh, uh, fi about 50 to 70 qubits on them. Okay, but you know, why are we talking about just 50 qubits or 30 qubits or 70? You know, why not millions of qubits? Just like we have trillions or even you know, quadrillions of bits in our classical computers. 
Uh, well, uh, the fundamental engineering problem of building a quantum computer was understood since the very beginning. Uh, it's called decoherence. And uh, it means unwanted interaction between the qubits and their external environment, which has the effect of prematurely measuring the qubit. Right? I said before that if you look at a qubit, you force it to decide, you make it collapse to either the zero state or the one state. Um, and then you know, it sort of, it loses its superposition behavior, right? Now it's just one or the other. Okay, but crucially, it doesn't have to be you who's looking or any conscious being for that matter. Okay, if there is any uh, um, noise in your system that you know, causes interaction between the qubit and the radiation or the air in the room, or you know the wafer that it's on on the chip or any of that, um, and and if that carries away the information about whether the qubit was a zero or a one, you know leaks that information into the outside world, then the effect on the qubit will be exactly as if someone had measured it. Okay, uh, so what this means, you know, I'm 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 told by people who know how to cook, that it's like cooking a souffle, right? You can't open the oven until it's done, okay? So you have to keep your qubits, you know, incredibly well isolated from the environment so that, you know, they don't lose their quantum state. But at the same time, you can't keep them perfectly isolated because they have to interact with each other and you have to tell them exactly how to interact, right? So. Uh, you know, so th this is a staggeringly hard problem to arrange all of this. You know, it's so hard that there have been respected physicists and computer scientists who said this is fundamentally impossible. You will never do this. Now, the thing that changed most people's view uh, was a, a, another um, huge theoretical discovery in the mid 1990s. And this was called quantum error correction and quantum fault tolerance. And so this is now, you know, a whole theory, but the upshot of it is that you don't have to perfectly isolate your qubits from your environment, okay? If you want to build a reliable quantum computer, you know, that you can scale to any number of qubits. It is enough to really, really, really well isolate your qubits from, from the environment, okay? It doesn't, doesn't have to be perfect. What you can do is you can, uh, encode the information that you care about uh, across the collective states of many physical qubits using very clever quantum generalizations of error correcting codes. Okay? And you can do it in such a way that even if any small percentage of your qubits were to leak their states into the environment, uh, you can detect that that has happened and you can correct it. You can recover what you need from the remaining qubits and just keep going forward, right? Amazingly, you know, without ever disturbing the uh, the actual information that, that that matters for the computation. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, to 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 get to fault tolerance, there's like a break-even point, right? If your physical error rate is too high, then when when you try to do this error correction, you just make things worse rather than making them better, okay? So there's a break even point, you know, you can think of it like the, uh, uh, the critical mass for a nuclear chain reaction, right? Where each round of error correction starts making things better and better rather than making them worse and worse. We are not yet at that break even point, okay? That is why we do not yet have, you know, useful quantum computers with thousands or, or millions of qubits. Um, on the other hand, if you look at the error rates that the experimentalists can achieve today, they are orders of magnitude better than they were than when I started in this field uh, 20 or so years ago. Okay, uh, um, they are you know maybe you know two or three orders of magnitude away still you know from um, from from the threshold where you know quantum error correction starts working. But you know, the, you know, we are, you know, we are now, you know, much more in striking distance than uh, than than in the in the 90s or the or the early 2000s. So, um, um, you know, and and uh, uh, if if there is a fundamental barrier, then it hasn't been discovered yet. Okay, but you know, I, you know, it, it would be great to you know 
directly test these questions, right? Uh, I mean, you know, the, the, the trouble is, you know, when, if, if you're not yet at the threshold for fault tolerance, then any quantum computer that you can possibly build, right, it, it's going, you know, the, it, everything is going to fall apart pretty quickly, right? Uh, you, can I ask you about this fault tolerance threshold? Yeah. So classically in engineering, uh, it doesn't seem like a problem that comes up, I guess maybe sort of in like in settings of like very cold temperatures or so on, but where there's a threshold uh, in something like this, generally the feeling is that you just improve things incrementally and eventually, you know, engineering solves those problems. Is there a reason to believe that this threshold is somehow fundamentally different than any other well, engineering one? I mean, I mean, I think we know, you know, many, you know, other examples of phase transition type of phenomena, right? You know, as, as I said, like, you know, ha um, um, if, if, if I have half of a critical mass, I can't get half as big of a nuclear explosion, right? I mean, th there is also a fault tolerance threshold for classical computing, by the way. It's just, it's just not as relevant because, you know, once transistors were invented, they were so far beyond the threshold that, that we didn't have to worry about it. Um, you know, but, but I mean, there are many engineering systems where, you know, if, if you can, if you can get halfway to some milestone, like, you know, or if I could launch a rocket, you know, um, 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 halfway into orbital velocity or into escape velocity, you know, I don't, you know, I don't get half as far, I just crash, right? So, um, um, you know, I, I think it, it's, you know, maybe it's analogous to, the, to those sorts of phenomena, right? But certainly but, no one... No one had a crisis of faith about, for instance, achieving orbital escape velocity. Yeah, well, you know, I look, um, um, I don't have a crisis of faith about this. Okay. You know? <laughs> but, um, but, you know, there are others who do, and that's actually a perfect lead in to my next slide, which is can't we, you know, using the technology that exists today, can we at least try to prove the point or, you know, answer the skeptics who say that this is never going to work? by doing something beyond what we could easily do with any classical computer. Okay, so this is a goal that, um, well, I mean, the, the idea was around for a long time, but uh, the word, the name for it was coined uh, eight years ago by my good friend, uh, uh, the physicist, John Preskill. And uh, he, he called it quantum supremacy. Now he's more recently, he's expressed some regrets about this name. Uh, you know, either, you know, because it's too overhyped or because it, you know, reminds people of, you know, the sort of um, um, evil kinds of supremacy that, uh, uh, you know, but, um, you know, for, 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 for better or worse, this, this name is stuck. So what, what Preskill meant by it and uh, what I will mean by it is, um, um, you know, doing something with a quantum computer, uh, uh, some well-defined task. Uh, much faster than we know how to do it with any currently existing classical computer. Okay. Now, notice that I did not say a useful task. Okay. That that you know that that is not a requirement here. It can be a totally artificial benchmark. That's fine. But it's got to be well defined what we're doing. Uh, so you know the way you know what what, what 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 I like to say is that for me personally, you know this is the number one application of a quantum. Right. I mean. Yes, you know, we could simulate quantum physics that has lots of industrial applications. You know, there is breaking codes. There's, there's some other things, you know, that, that uh, uh, I guess uh, funding agencies care about. Okay, but for me personally, that's all icing on the cake. Mostly, you know, I want to disprove my colleagues who say that this is, this is all, uh, all just a fantasy and that this can never work. Um, so, uh, so quantum supremacy is targeting that application. Okay. Now, uh, you know, you could say that the gold standard for a demonstration of quantum supremacy would be, you know, to run, you know, the, the most famous quantum algorithm of them all. Okay, and this is called Shor's algorithm. So uh, in 1994, uh, Peter Shor uh, discovered that, you know, if you could build a scalable quantum computer, you could use it to uh, factor huge numbers. You could factor an n-digit number in only about n squared steps. Uh, why is that important? You know, factor it into primes. Uh, why is that important? Well, uh, um, anytime we buy stuff over the internet, uh, you know, our um, credit card number is protected by uh, 
a public key encryption system whose security depends on the belief that factoring is a hard problem or that a few other related problems are hard, which uh, uh, Shor's, uh, which, which Shor's algorithm could also solve, okay? So what Shor showed is that if you could build scalable quantum computers, then you can break almost all of the uh, encryption that currently protects the internet. Um, so, you know, that made lots of people excited about quantum computing who hadn't been before, you know, and it would also be a super clear debt demonstration of quantum supremacy because, you know, if you use a quantum computer to factor a 10,000 digit number, uh, you know, then, then, you know, anyone else can just check the prime factors for themselves, right? They don't have to believe you. They can, they can multiply the, the factors themselves and they can, you know, they can see that you, you broke the code. Um, unfortunately, as I said, um, to, to do Shor's algorithm, you know, you really, really seem to need uh, fault tolerance. And, you know, that might mean millions of physical qubits at the least, okay? And so, uh, you know, uh, um, that, that looks still a ways off, okay? Uh, but there is a different, there's a completely different idea for how you could demonstrate quantum supremacy. Uh, and and this, this other way um, arose out of work that um, um, some of us did uh, uh, over the last decade or so. And uh, it is to look at what we call sampling problems. So uh, a sampling problem is a problem where there's not just a single right answer. Okay, there is a whole probability distribution over different possible right answers. And your goal is just to sample outputs you know, according to that distribution. Okay, so you know where the the uh, um, you know um, um, some answers should be more likely to occur, others should be less. Okay, sampling problems also have you know a long and illustrious history in computer science. Um, why are we talking about them now? Well, um, there turn out to be two big advantages. Uh, one is that. Uh, you know, if all we want is sort of theoretical evidence that we are doing something that is hard for a classical computer, then sampling problems turn out to be uh, extremely well suited for that. Okay, so factoring, you know, we think that there's a, a big quantum speed up there, but no one has ruled out that there could be a fast classical algorithm for factoring, right? And, you know, and, and I would say that, that, you know, many number theorists I've talked to even suspect that there is one. It's just that you know we 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 uh, um, uh, we 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 base our encryption on the belief that there isn't, but it's it's from a theoretical point of view, factoring is kind of like who knows it could go either way. Okay, uh, what um uh, so so working with a student named um, Alex Arkhipov um, a decade ago, I proposed uh, something called called boson sampling which was a uh, proposal for how to build an optical quantum computer that would solve one of these sampling problems. And we were able to give uh, theoretical evidence uh, that, that a classical computer would not be able to solve the same sampling problem quickly uh, that I think is uh, stronger uh, than, than let's say the, the evidence that factoring is, is a classically hard problem. Um, and so, you know, that, and, and then that was sort of our original motivation for, for studying this. Uh, and, and others, uh, like Bremner, Joza, and Shepard were uh, studying related uh, ideas uh, independently from us. Um, and, um, you know, and, and, and all of us just kind of motivated by uh, computational complexity, you know, by like how strong can we make the evidence that a quantum system is hard to simulate classically. Okay, but then uh, people realized something not long afterward. They, you know, we started talking to the experimentalists and they said, you know, these sampling problems that you're talking about, we might actually be able to build this. We might actually be able to realize this with only 50 or so particles, you know, 50 or so qubits. You know, this looks way, way easier than doing Shor's algorithm. Okay, and so then that provided a, uh, uh, you know, another, you know, more, more immediate motivation for uh, thinking about these sampling problems. Okay, and that brings us to what Google did. So um, around 2015, uh, um, Google, uh, well, they uh, hired John Martinez, who was maybe, you know, the uh, um, led maybe, maybe the, the leading group in the world 
uh, building uh, super, uh, these um, um, superconducting uh, qubit chips. And uh, they decided that they wanted to go for quantum supremacy uh, using 50 or, or 60 or so qubits. And so I actually started an email thread with the Google people about, you know, like, we, you know, we heard you want to do this. Uh, you know, here are the you know, different ideas about how one could go about it. I included a bunch of colleagues in the uh, theory community. And, you know, we sort of, we debated the different proposals, you know, how, like, uh, um, because, you know, Google, you know, they, like, they, they knew what they wanted to build, but they didn't know once they had built it, uh, what do you do with it, right? What do you do that, you know, that is hard to simulate with a classical computer? How, how sure are we that, that it really is hard to simulate classically? And also, how do you verify that the quantum computer actually has done it? Okay, so it was out of that discussion that um, Google uh, decided on an approach called random circuit sampling, uh, which I'll, I'll show you shortly. Okay, but basically, you know, they built a 53 qubit uh, chip uh, called Sycamore. Uh, if you're wondering why 53 qubits, well, they built 54. Uh, in, a, in a rectangular grid, and one of them didn't work. Okay, uh, and then they used their chip to sample from a probability distribution over 53-bit strings. Okay, so just to calibrate, you know, the number of possible outputs of this quantum computer is two to the 53 power, which is about nine quadrillion, uh, and all the outputs are very, very unlikely. Okay, so you know, in the whole lifetime of the experiment, we don't expect the same output to ever appear twice. Okay, but as we'll see, some outputs are a little bit unlikelier than others. Okay, and it's those deviations away from, from uniform randomness that are the thing that we are looking for as the signature of quantum supremacy. And it's those deviations that we conjecture that a classical computer would not be able to efficiently reproduce. Okay, so in a little bit more detail, uh, what we do is, you know, we have these qubits arranged in, let's say, a square, a uh, roughly square lattice. Each qubit can interact with its immediate neighbors, you know, in some prescribed way, like, like that. Okay, so that, you know, we can get, uh, by uh, composing these operations, we can get a signal from any qubit uh, in, the, in the grid to any other one. And uh, you know, so, so what, you know, and, and we can program in the sequence of operations. We can tell each qubit how to interact with each neighbor when. So how do we tell them to interact? Well, I'm almost embarrassed to tell you, but we just give them a random sequence of instructions, okay? a, what we call a random quantum circuit, okay? But we remember which random circuit, okay? So a skeptic, if you like, challenges the quantum computer by sending it a random sequence of instructions, say a random circuit C on our n qubits, let's say n is 53 here. And then uh, the skeptic demands that the quantum computer quickly send back some samples from the output distribution that you would get by starting with the qubits being all zeros and then applying those instructions and then measuring each qubit to see whether it's zero or one. That gives a distribution that we could call D sub C. Okay, and then, you know, here's maybe the, the more interesting part. Uh, now we just have all of these samples that we've seen from our quantum computer. Now, what do we do with them? How do we check whether, whether anything interesting happened? Well, now we have to, with our, uh, uh, we have to apply some tests using our classical computer, okay? And the test that Google ended up using, they called it the linear cross entropy benchmark or linear XCD, okay? But it's really, really simple. All they do is using a lot of brute force, they calculate what, what, was, what, what should have been the probability for each output that they saw. So they calculate the ideal probability for each uh, for each of the outputs that were observed, that is S1, S2, up to SK, um, um, they, you know, the, the, the probabilities being these, these squared um, 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 absolute values here, then they just add them all up. They add up all K of them. And you can think of K as being a few million. Okay? That's the number of samples. And then they judge the test to have passed 
if and only if this sum exceeds a certain threshold. Okay, so they just want the sum to be large. Uh, now, what is going on here? Well, if suppose that Google was lying, they had no quantum computer and they were just picking these samples, S1, S2, and so on, as completely random strings. In that case, we would expect the probability of each one to be about two to the minus n on average, which means that if I add up uh, k of them, then I'll, I'm going to get about k divided by two to the n. Okay, but if we have a true quantum computer, and let's assume that it's got no noise in it, so it's uh, errorless, then um, you know, as, as I said, some outcomes are likelier than others, and the ones with higher probabilities should be more likely to show up. And so that, that means that this sum should be larger. And if you do a calculation, what you find is that the expected value of the sum should be about 2K over 2 to the N. So exactly twice uh, the trivial classical value. Okay, so now we have our, our test, our experiment, which is can we actually see that the value of the sum is higher than the, 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 the classical value? Um, in its experiment, you know, and, 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 that, and that's encoded in this number B, which is somewhere between one and two, T two being a perfect quantum computer, one being a, uh, uh, let's say, what, what, uh, the best that we think that a classical computer could do, okay? Uh, in its experiment, Google reported uh, the, uh, the, a value of B that they measured that was about 1.002, okay? So, Slight, you know, only very, very slightly above the classical value. But, you know, they took enough samples that they could verify to like 10 or 20 sigma that it really is more than one. Okay, you, you know, you really are seeing something. there. Okay, so, you know, again, all the possible output strings are exponentially unlikely, but some are unlikelier than others. Um, uh, you know, you get, uh, um, um, you can analogize it to a speckle pattern. Like if I took a laser pointer and I sent the uh, light through some ground glass, then uh, the photons will be a little bit likelier to land in certain spots on a screen than in other spots, because in some spots I will get more constructive interference among all the different paths that the photon could take, and in others I get more destructive interference, right? And the same thing is going on with the quantum supremacy experiment, except here instead of a screen, we have this abstract space of nine quadrillion possible output strings, okay? But again, for some of the strings, there's a little bit more constructive interference among all of the paths that lead to their amplitude. And for others, there's a little bit more destructive interference, okay? And so, you know, some of them might have like a one in 10 quadrillion chance of appearing, but others will have a one in two quadrillion chance. So on the... Um, the probabilities actually turn out to be exponentially distributed random variables for those who are interested. And that's because the amplitudes uh, are very, very close to being just independent uh, complex Gaussians. Okay, so um, some of you might have heard, you know, so, 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 so Google put out this quantum uh, supremacy claim and, you know, I guess last October, um, actually, uh, what, what, what happened first is that it, it, their paper accidentally leaked because uh, uh, NASA, which collaborated with Google, put it on their public website by accident, and then the media picked it up, and it got all over the world, and, you know, Google was still under embargo from nature, so they couldn't comment on it. Uh, you know, I, I knew about it, so, you know, I, I used my blog to, you know, uh, uh, talk to people about it, but, um, um, you know, even before the paper had come out, uh, IBM, which is maybe Google's biggest competitor in superconducting qubits, uh, put out a response. Now, IBM's first response was, we reject the entire concept of quantum supremacy because all that matters is solving practical problems for customers. Uh, I was deeply dissatisfied with that response. It's like, you know, like, it, you know, is, 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 isn't it obvious that, you know, uh, you you do what the Wright brothers did, and you know you you build the plane and show that it can stay in the air before you start booking passengers. You know, and uh, uh, 
um, selling frequent flyer miles, right? So, uh, but then a few weeks later, you know, IBM put out a more robust response, which was, well, you know, we don't think that Google has achieved quantum supremacy at all. And here was their argument. Uh, if you take Summit, which is the largest supercomputer that currently exists on earth, so it fills the area of two basketball courts, and um, it has um, about 250 petabytes of hard disk space. Uh, they said, you could just take the entire amplitude vector, uh, all nine quadrillion of the amplitudes, and just write them all to hard disk. And if you did that, then the calculation that Google had did with its chip, the quantum supremacy demo, which took them about three minutes, um, they could do it in about two and a half days. Okay, so Google had estimated it would have taken about 10,000 years. They, you know, they actually didn't directly even verify, they could, for that reason, they couldn't even directly verify their hardest experiments. They only verified, uh, you know, ones with like slightly smaller numbers of qubits. Okay, but um, uh, IBM said, well, if we use Summit, then we could verify what Google did, but we could also simulate what Google did, you know, in a, in a mere two and a half days or so. So, you know, to me, I mean, I mean, I think that it was embarrassing that Google didn't notice this, that, you know, they were only thinking about storing everything to RAM and, you know, and they hadn't thought about if, you know, if you had a hard disk big enough to store nine quadrillion complex numbers, which, you know, one of which actually exists. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, you could say that, that if this is the best response, then, you know, it's all, I mean, you know, it's almost like a backhanded compliment, right? It's almost like the Kasparov versus Deep Blue chess match, except with the immense irony that IBM is now in the role of Gary Kasparov, right? Saying like, well, with, with heroic effort, we can maybe, you know, come close to matching what this 53-bit quantum computer is doing. But if that's what it takes, then, you know, in another year or two, I mean, Google's right now building a 72 qubit version of the chip, right? How many summits are you going to need for that, right? Millions, right? Uh, if you wanted to do the same thing. Okay, so it looks like we're at this kind of crossover point, at least for these sampling tasks where quantum computers are exceeding what a classical computer can, you know, or any of the classical computers that currently exist uh, could simulate or keep up with. Uh, so, you know, a lot of what my students and I did over the last couple of uh, years was sort of theoretical work uh, that aimed at trying to justify this conclusion. So, you know, we don't know, you know, like, could there be a classical algorithm that could simulate uh, these random circuits to simulate what Google was doing uh, in, you know, very quickly, right? If anyone discovered such an algorithm, then that would kill Google's claim of quantum supremacy, okay? Uh, and, and, and we can't rule it out. Okay, but what we can do is we can give some theoretical evidence that such an algorithm is un seems unlikely, or at any rate, would that it would represent a breakthrough in theoretical computer science. And so, with uh, Li Ji Chen, um, who's then a, an undergrad visiting uh, MIT, uh, later with a UT Austin undergrad named Sam Gunn, uh, we were able to show that if you had a fast classical algorithm that could spoof Google's linear cross entropy benchmark, then you would also get a fast classical algorithm that could you know, take a random quantum circuit and estimate specific outcomes, uh, uh, specific amplitudes much faster than a classical computer could. And that, that seems like it would be a real breakthrough. Okay, so, you know, so right now there is this barrier. All the classical algorithms that we know seem to use an amount of time that grows like at least like two to the power of the number of qubits. No one has yet breached that barrier. If they could, they could kill Google's results. Uh, now, until very, very recently, people, you know, uh, said, okay, quantum supremacy, you know, maybe we believe it, maybe it's fine, but it's obviously useless. It has no application because you're just generating all these totally random bits. And what's the point of that? Well, a couple of years ago, it occurred to me that completely random bits might not be totally useless, at least if you can prove to a skeptic that they're completely random, okay? Uh, so, you know, there are lots of cryptographic applications 
um, where you need like to broadcast bits over the internet and actually be able to prove to anyone that these bits were generated randomly, that there's no secret pattern to them. Okay, what would be an example? Uh, proof of stake cryptocurrencies. These are alternatives to Bitcoin, okay, which are way more environmentally friendly. You know, they don't need 1% of the world's electricity to, you know, do uh, useless computations. Uh, but, uh, you know, what they need is a huge randomness beacon to sort of decide, run a lottery to decide who gets to add the next block to the blockchain, basically. And, you know, and then billions of dollars are riding on the belief that no one has inserted a secret pattern into these numbers. Okay, so what I noticed is that once you have a quantum computer that can uh, uh, pass this linear cross entropy benchmark, like the one that Google now has, then you could almost immediately repurpose it to get a randomness beacon where you know, by, by checking that uh, the, the linear cross entropy benchmark is, is, is being passed, you get a sort of cryptographic certificate of randomness. Okay? Even a quantum computer, we think, should not be able to pass this benchmark quickly, except by sampling the result randomly. Okay, so um, you can use it for uh, what we call certified randomness. Um, Google is actually right now working to uh, demonstrate this protocol, you know, and um, there's some hope that it could be the first realizable application of quantum computing. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, uh, work needed to make it practical and, you know, the, the verification is very expensive. So, you know, it's not clear if it will actually be useful, but, you know, uh, uh, you know, at least, at least I, I, I would say we don't, we don't, we, 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 we don't have a proof that, uh, that it's not useful. Okay, so, you know, one does have to be careful about quantum, you know, uh, uh, are you achieving quantum supremacy or not? Just to illustrate the subtlety, and because there's a connection here to University of Washington, I wanted to mention that a couple of years ago, I had an 18-year-old uh, undergrad working with me. Uh, her name was Ewin Tang, and uh, for her uh, a project that she did with me, uh, she actually took one of the um, maybe the main example that we had had of that time uh, at that time of a quantum algorithm that was believed to get an exponential speed up for a machine learning problem. Okay, it was about re uh, recommending you know products like movies and, and Netflix, recommending things to users, and Ewin was able to dequantize that algorithm. That is, she found a classical algorithm with similar performance. Okay, the task that I had given her was to uh, try to prove that this exponential quantum speed up is for real, right? Because no one had proven that at the time. Try to rule out that there's a fast classical algorithm. She tried for a year and was not able to do that. Ultimately, the reason was that, you know, there is a fast classical algorithm. Okay, this is, this is sort of, you know, what is so, you know, I think what the, maybe one of the biggest things people don't appreciate about quantum algorithms is that, you know, um, um, you know, we are fighting against classical compute, right? It's only interesting to the extent that we can beat classical computing. And classical computing is a moving target. It can fight back. Okay, this is, you know, um, and, and so as we learn more about quantum computing, we also have to learn more about the limits of classical computing if we want to know that the quantum advantages are for real. As I said, Ewin is now a, a PhD student at University of Washington. Okay, so to summarize, you know, I think this is a particularly exciting time for quantum computing. Um, after decades of theory and experiment, we finally started to see clear speed ups over classical computers for specialized problems with, you know, 50 or soon 70 qubit devices, uh, achieving full scalability and fault tolerance and, you know, threatening our encryption and all that stuff, that's going to take a while longer. Um, Quantum speed ups, you know, uh, um, um, unfortunately for a lot of the, the people who would, who would like them to just apply to everything, they are a very subtle business, okay? They depend on exploiting the, sh the structure of your problem, choreographing a pattern of interference that concentrates amplitude on the right answer to your problem. So it is not just unlimited free exponential parallelism. It's a very weird resource I like to say it is weirder than any science fiction writer would have had the imagination to invent. 
but you know we are figuring out some things that you can do with it. So with that, uh, thank you all for listening. I apologize for going a little bit over and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Scott, for an excellent talk. So now I would like to ask the audience if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the Q&A window that you see in Zoom. Um, and among our panelists, if someone has a question, they can unmute and ask. Uh, actually, I see one question that earlier came in the in the Q and A window, uh, and some of our panelists were discussing it. But let me ask what Scott thinks of it. Uh, mm -hmm. Related to James Z's question, the standard mm -hmm. joke about nuclear fusion power generation is that it's just been around the corner for the past fifty years. Is there yeah. any reason to suppose quantum computing will not be around the corner forever? I mean, I mean that that's certainly possible, right? I mean. Um, I, I think that, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, we, we are sort of asking what, what, what I tell people here, you know, is that if there, if there is a deep reason why a quantum computer cannot be built, uh, then that is more exciting to me than if it can be built. Okay? That, that is a revolution in physics, right? You know, the idea that a quantum computer ultimately can be built and it'll work like the theory says, that is the boring possibility. That's the conservative possibility. Okay, that's the one that doesn't require any change to known physics. Um, you know, I I, uh, I have colleagues uh, like uh, the mathematician Gil Kalai, you know, computer scientists like uh, Oded Goldreich, uh, Leonid Levin, uh, uh, some some well-known physicists like Bob Laughlin, who you know who believe that that, that this will never work, right? And if it could ever be proven, you know, why it will never work, right? That is, that is, that is revolutionary, okay? That would change our understanding of quantum mechanics itself. Now, of course, like you said, with the fusion example, something can be possible and yet just, you know, sort of, you know, always, always, you know, over the horizon. Well, I should say, I mean, I mean, fusion power, I mean, I mean, we, we do know several ways to, to get it already. Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, we can, we can use solar panels and just, you know, uh, uh, um, 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 you know, uh, take advantage of the fusion that, that that the sun is doing, right? Where where, where gravity holds it together. Uh, we can also, uh, you know, if, if if we really wanted to, we could generate uh, electricity by uh, exploding hydrogen bombs underground. Okay, that would also be fu fusion power. It just it's not politically palatable. Okay, so. Uh, um, you know, but but uh, you know, and, and and as for you know, getting controlled, you know, confined fusion. You know, I, I've actually I was just reading in the last couple of weeks that people are now optimistic again that you know that that is actually going to work. But you know, I mean, look, you know, of course, all all you can do, you know, I w w one thing that I never ever do is like give people a time, you know, say, oh yeah. I promise you in 10 years, we're going to have a useful device. Like I have no idea, right? If I was able to forecast how long things would take then I wouldn't have become an academic, I would have become an investor, right? So, you know, I don't know how long it's going to take. I mean, for that matter, I mean, I don't know how long civilization is going to live. I mean, especially here, like, oh my God, right? But, you know, if we can hold our civilization together for long enough, then, you know, things that, you know, I, I feel like ultimately we ought to be able to do the things that the laws of physics says are possible. And, you know, according to our current understanding of the laws of physics, quantum computing seems like it's possible. I mean, that's, 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 that's the most basic thing to say. But the other thing to say is that the experimental work in, you know, quantum computing has, has made enormous strides over the last 20 years. Right, and you don't necessarily see that if you ask, well, how big a number can you factor, or something like that, right? You know, or it's still like twenty-one is three times seven, or you know, some you know trivial uh, demonstration like that. But if you look at the coherence times of the qubits, those have improved by orders of magnitude, and there doesn't seem to be you know an obvious place where that has to stop. So I think it does make sense to you know while like while while fighting the hype fighting the irresponsible claims that some people make that they have useful applications already or right around the corner or something like that. But, you know, while being responsible in the claims that we make, try to pursue this research program to wherever it leads, you know, which, which 
um, you know, um, hopefully will be either a quantum computer or else some either some even more revolutionary discovery about physics. And, and, and not just mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, the, the boring outcome of just running out of funding. Yes, that certainly makes a good case for it to be hopeful, but yeah, exactly, nobody exactly knows. Mm -hmm. um, another question uh, that came through the chat is, from a theoretical point of view, does quantum computing maintain a superior operation count even if the phase can only have a smallish discrete set of values? Entanglement um, is still possible. Oh, okay. So, um, um, so it, it's actually okay. So you're asking about like discretization of the amplitude quantum mechanics. Now, it, it's actually really, really hard to force the amplitudes to belong to a discrete set, even if you're trying for that, even if it's your goal, right? And you know, the the, the reason oh, it is slightly technical, but you know, we're, we're talking about the group of unitary transformations, the group of unitary matrices. And you know this is a group that just um, you know does not have you know very you know enormous discrete subgroups, right? If you try to create a large enough discrete subgroup, then what you typically find is that you just densely generate the entire group, or you you know you densely generate some whole continuous subgroup. Okay, so this is sort of an intuitive reason why we think the amplitudes form a continuum, right? And why you know, actually trying to discretize the amplitudes, you know, seems to, you know, people have thought about it, but it seems to make almost as little sense as discretizing probabilities, like forcing probabilities to belong to a discrete set, right? Um, now, there are uh, some special uh, subset, special subclasses of quantum computation where you can only generate amplitudes and phases that are in a discrete set. Uh, a famous example of this is called the stabilizer operation, right? the uh, uh, stabilizer gates. These play a central role in the theory of quantum error correction. Okay, uh, but these also have the property that they can be efficiently simulated with a classical computer. Okay, so they do not themselves give you a quantum speed up, or at any rate, not a big quantum speed up. Uh, and so, when people are are talking about uh, uh, um, um, engineering approaches to quantum computing, often when you have error corrected qubits, it is very easy to do these stabilizer operations, this discrete set that's easy to simulate classically. Uh, but the hard part is if you want it to be interesting, you, you also need non-stabilizer operations, right? That would go outside of, the, of that discrete set, uh, you know, into the whole continuum of amplitudes and make the thing, uh, 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 hard to simulate, you know, and do do interesting computations. So a lot of the engineering work, you know, in, in quantum error correction and quantum fault tolerance is exactly about how do we do non-stabilizer operations on our error corrected qubits because that that's sort of the most expensive part. The challenge, right? Mm -hmm. um, by the way, I was asked. Uh, oh yeah, so can you stop sharing your screen? Then people. Oh uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So. There you go. Uh, even staff was asking that. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Um, there are lots of questions. Actually, let me okay. just pause for a second and ask if any of our panelists would like to ask a question. If yes, you can unmute and go ahead. Questions or comments? Um, if not, there are more I'll, questions. I'll go. Oh. I'll go. Hi, yeah, Scott. Dave. Hey, Dave. How are you doing? Hey, hey do, do, do you have, do, do you want me to define what a qubit is? What, what, yes, what, what? yes, I want you to define a qubit. I've been working in quantum almost as long as Scott. Um, <laughs> here's a good question for you. So there's this like famous quote that Feynman always said, is quoted, it's tribute to Feynman. I don't know if he said it. He says, I think I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics is strange, right? But we use it all the day and we, we definitely understand it, right? But I wonder what your perspective is on just, it is weird and it has these, you know, spooky correlations and, you know, like, does that matter, right? Like, could we just ignore that and just continue to do quantum computing or should we care about like the fact that it is very well, mysterious how this works in some fundamental way? Well, well, look, I mean, I mean, I mean, the mystery is what brought me here in the first place, right? You know, I don't, I don't like, uh, I don't have, uh, 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 I don't stay up at night with a burning need 
to, you know, steal people's credit card numbers, right? Or, you know, break RSA, right? I mean, that's, that, 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 that's not why I'm in this field, right? I'm, I'm in this field because, you know, I mean, uh, the, you know, the limits of computation are mysterious. You know, P versus NP problem is mysterious. And quantum mechanics is also mysterious. And quantum computing is a field that throws all of it together. And maybe if we understand that, then it will shed more light on these big mysteries. Uh, so that's that's that that's that's why I got into this in the first place, and um, you know, and, and I think um, uh, you know. So I mean, I, I think I think it, it it does matter. I mean, but you know, it, it uh, um, you know, I mean, I mean, often often you know, there 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 are some mysteries that uh, you know, even 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 if they're never solved, they may they 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 may still be fruitful, right? They may still you know inspire people. To pick off little related questions or sub questions that, that that actually can be solved, right? And I think you know understanding the true nature of quantum mechanics is is maybe in that class. So the good news is Scott is not an imposter. That's the same Scott that I knew when he gave one of his first talks at Caltech. Uh, the, but I'm going to ask a follow up, which is, do you think we've made progress on this problem of understanding quantum, or is is it still? Do you think well, quantum has helped in that? Do you think there's any, yeah. or are we still sort of as confused as we were back in when we started yeah. thinking about this? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think you know, you can you can you can ask this about any of the sort of the biggest questions of philosophy, right? Like, like you know, have you know all all of the research that that's happened in neuroscience. Has it told us anything whatsoever about consciousness, or are we just as confused about consciousness as the ancient Greeks were? Right. All of the work in in mathematics has it ever, you know, clarified what is infinity, or are we just as confused about that? I mean, I I I I, I tend to think, you know, um, uh, you know, it's it, it, it's kind of like, you know, even even if. Uh, 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 you know, a road is infinitely long, you know, and like, no matter how far you go, uh, you know, you are, you know, you're still infinitely far from the destination. Well, you're still further and further from your starting point, right? You know, you can, you can still walk down the path and learn stuff. I mean, like, you know, to me, the, uh, the bell inequality, right? I mean, you know, our, our whole understanding of, of, you know, the debates that Bohr and Einstein were having and what is entanglement and what is this all about is different after you know the Bell inequality than before you know it, right? And that was a technical result. And it was, you know, until the, the, uh, the 60s, you know, that, that anyone thought of it, right? And, and I think, you know, with, with quantum computing and with, you know, all of the developments that are happening right now with it from qubit and with connections to the black hole information problem, you know, I think that that we are understanding something, you know, uh, important about quantum mechanics itself that uh, that that uh, that people didn't know before, right? That you could you could have, you know, if you dug Feynman out of the grave and told it to him, you'd be like, oh, you know, that's interesting. I didn't know that, right? Um, you know, in the, in the in the same way that, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, I mean, Gödel's theorem didn't solve all the mysteries of math, but like it's like it's one of these things that after you know it, like you just you just pity the people who didn't know it, like well, you know, like how 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 just you know um um, um how ignorant you know uh, were they, right? So you know, so that I think that 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 should be our goal, maybe not to understand everything, but at least to understand things that will then look back and say how ignorant could we have been not to know those things. So we are running out of time for more questions, but I wanted to point out in the Q and A we also have a lot of thank yous and. Uh, uh, also mentions of, oh, your blog has helped me in my teaching. So lots of people have uh, nice comments. And, oh, well, uh, thank you very much. And, and thank you, everyone, for listening. Yeah, we had about 300 people uh, at the <laughs> attending. So thank you very much again. We, uh, but I would like to now pass uh, the stage again to Eric uh, to conclude. Great. Uh, well, um... First of all, thank you, Scott, for a, a really fun talk. And thank you for everybody who are posting and answering and conversing in the chat. I think you can tell that um, maybe one of the most exciting reasons to focus on quantum computing as an engineering endeavor is because um, it's exciting and interesting and filled with mystery. And I really thank Scott for reminding um, us of that. So um, that was great. Uh, 
Uh, I want to take a moment to thank um, everybody who helped um, organize the event, uh, including our PR and advancement teams. And I really want to recognize the Lytle family for making this lecture series possible. Um, and with that, uh, thank you all for attending and, um, and congratulations everyone on a, on a wonderful Lytle lecture series. All right, well, thanks again. Thank yeah, you, Scott. You yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, the panelists can stick around if, if they want to keep talking. Yeah. I'm sure yeah. we'll leave the channel. All right. All right. It's kind of like after a real talk when people stand around by the podium and chat, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, Dave, how have you been? Long I'm time I see. I'm a Scott groupie. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna well, I'm come a, around and glom I, around I, you. I, 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 I've been a Dave Bacon groupie. So. <laughs> uh, but you, you, you are, you are in a new place now. Uh, yeah, I'm in Seattle still, right? So okay, okay. Uh, yeah, I think you will open an office here once the offices are a thing. Anymore. Oh right, I am. <laughs> yeah, right. Also, okay. So, yeah, switched wow. over. Uh, yeah, so I mean, every, every every time I think I've got you pegged, that I know what you're up to. You just you you roll the dice again. That's right. Exactly. It's time to try something new. And yeah. then I, I time bend myself and say in three years or two years, two and a half years, I'll, I'll reevaluate and see what to do next. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so does INQ launch just very recently, is that right? Well, it's been around for five years. And, you know, the founder, oh. you know, Chris Monroe is the like with Dave Wineland, who is a UW postdoc, uh, you know, a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, uh, they did the first quantum gate in like 90. 96 Ooh. in ions which was amazing because the theory paper Sirac Zoller came out and then it was like literally like just a couple months later that they did that gate which at that point you could have thought like oh quantum computers are around the corner <laughs> but it was you know that was a really really amazing experiment um, mm -hmm. so. so Scott I have a question I, I never really yeah. got uh, on the sure, sure, sure. well so when the supremacy came out, the Jianwei yeah. Pan also had this PRL paper on bosons. Oh, oh, Jianwei Pan. Yeah. yeah. So how different they are? I mean, I, I don't, I don't understand yeah. the theory that what is the, okay. they both cited your paper and they, I think, cross cited each other as well. Yeah, sure. And that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, so, um, so, so, so Jianwei Pan's group is, uh, is working to demonstrate quantum supremacy using boson sampling which was the original proposal that Alex Arkhipov and I had a decade ago, right? Uh, you know, now the Google group, they considered doing boson sampling, right? Because there was an idea that you could, you know, once you built superconducting qubits like theirs, then you could use them to control microwave photons in, in resonators. And you could then do boson sampling with those photons, right? They considered, but now, now that would have required a massive amount of additional engineering on top of what they were already doing. And, and so, you know, what they decided around 2015 was, nah, you know what? Theorists are cheaper. So, you know, we're going to just go forward and build the kind of chip we wanted, and we're gonna leave it to the theorists to figure out how they can adapt boson sampling to the kind of hardware that we have, right? And, um, you know, what, 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 what would be a hard sampling problem for us? And, and we said, okay, we can do that, you know. You know, we think we, you know, we 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 think we can adapt the theory to uh, to uh, uh, to this setting, okay? But uh, in the meantime, the quantum optics people uh, continue to push forward with demonstrations of boson sampling. Now, the first demonstrations were with three photons. That's quite trivial to simulate with a classical computer. And then people did five or six photons. Uh, the latest published experiment. Uh, from um, Jianwei Pan's group, they detected 14 photons, okay? That's still pretty easy to simulate classically, right? And if you want quantum supremacy, you know, you're, you're gonna want on the order of 50 photons. Right. You know, the, the, the classical difficulty increases like two to the power of the number of photons roughly, yeah. just like it does with the, you know, the circuit-based supremacy, where it's like two to the power of the number of qubits, right? So um, Janway Pan's group uh, is working toward that 50 qubit demonstration. Uh, uh, I believe that they are making excellent progress toward it, but I'm, I'm probably not supposed to talk about it publicly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, there are still questions coming from, <laughs> from yeah. the audience. Okay. 
Um, I guess it's kind of late for Scott, though. Are you? It's seven. Dinner uh, time, right? In your time. Seven. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at some point, I'll you know, uh, 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 read to the kids, you know, put them get get yeah. the kids in bed, but uh, um, and and eat something. But that you know, that's all right. I I I also enjoy talking about quantum computing. So. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Maybe we will email yeah. you the remaining questions. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Sure. All right. All right. Well, then I, I guess I'll sign out then. But uh, nice, night, night, nice visiting. Oh, always nice to visit Seattle. Okay. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for, for everything right. you've done today for us. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. We'll get you up here, Scott, once the world yeah. returns to normal. Yes. So. Yes. And, 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 and you to Austin. All yeah, right. that's right. That's right. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Good. All right. Talk to you later. Okay, Thank bye. you so much. Okay. Bye. Thank you.